Right now would be a good time to Google the question, do men menstruate? If right now you happen to be drunk out of your mind, already wearing a lampshade on your head, and quickly running out of other jokes to keep your friends in the hot tub giggling helplessly until you can find some quiet place in which to violently vomit and collapse into unconsciousness. Because as it turns out, if you Google the question, do men menstruate, the first hilarious response Google will give you is this, quote, and this is an exact quote. Having a period is not a feminine thing. People of all genders menstruate, including non-binary people, agender people, and even plenty of men, unquote. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, Clavin, you raucously rambunctious maestro of merriment, how did you invent this absurd scenario that makes it seem as if one of the most powerful corporations on Earth is trying to drag the rest of us into a swirling toilet bowl of mendacity so that we'll be ultimately flushed into the twisted plumbing of stupidity and spat out into the sewer of cultural lunacy? But no, I am not making this up. In fact, according to the entire first page of responses on Google, menstruation, the process by which breeding age females who are not pregnant reabsorb their monthly ovum into the lining of their uterus and then expel that lining through their vaginas, can also take place in people who are not female, can't get pregnant, don't produce ova, don't have a uterus, and can't expel its lining through their vaginas, which they also don't have. What a wonderful font of information Google is for people who don't know the meaning of the word font and aren't interested in getting any information. Now, you may think, all right, when Google reports that men can do what they could only do in an alternative universe where words have no meaning and Google is a font of information, perhaps it would be true to say that Google has become a corrupt, politicized lie factory that replaced its original slogan of don't be evil with the new slogan, oh, what the hell, let's be so evil that even the word evil will not be evil enough to contain the evil that is Google level evil. But what about the rest of the response that says menstruation can occur in non-binary people and agender people and people with genders other than male and female and unicorns and brobdignags and coolie booly ulios and sacadella riccios and chugabuga naga dubadis and other non-existent creatures I just invented? Wouldn't it be a happier world if every single phantom that populates the fever dreams of woke insipidity could enjoy the same monthly bleeding, cramps, bloating, and irritability that were hitherto reserved only for those women so privileged they got to spend three days a month curled up on the sofa when they would much rather have been rampaging through Google headquarters with a butcher knife, cutting out the beating heart of every single mother-jumping moronic son of a bitch who thinks it's cool to say men can menstruate? And sure, maybe the non-existent creatures of Google's imaginary menagerie can not only menstruate, but are much less annoying than menstruating women because menstruating women have the disadvantage of actually existing when they menstruate, which is no walk in the park, or at least so I've been told. Still, you would think a corporation whose only purpose is to give you ready access to honest information so they can steal your personal browsing habits and sell them to other soulless corporate entities would at least create an algorithm that gives you ready access to honest information instead of lying to you about what's between your legs when a simple lowering of your chin will reveal to you that it isn't between your legs and even if through some act of surgical barbarism it were between your legs, it wouldn't be. Now, some of you may be thinking, gee, Clavin, you sound pretty irritable about this. Maybe it's your time of the month. And all I can say is, if menstruating is anywhere near as irritating as being lied to by a bunch of flabby-souled corporate jerkwads like the people at Google, I'm glad I'm a man and can use DuckDuckGo. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. All right, we are back laughing our way through the seething bowels of cultural <laughs> dissolution. To stop those seething bowels as a cure for those seething bowels, please pre-order The House of Love and Death, the new Cameron Winter mystery novel by me. I promise you, you will love it. It is. I am not just a conservative who is just making stuff. I am actually an artist making good stuff, and I think you will love this book, especially it is, they've, 
the first reviews have called it the best in the series. I think uh, it is a terrific series. I'm really proud of it, and I think you will love The House of Love and Death. Please pre-order it. It really helps. No matter how you do it, Kindle, Audible, it doesn't matter. If you get it, it will help me put it on a list, which then gives me the power to do more of them. There's one more already in the pipeline, but I would like to continue the series. Uh, also, you want to subscribe to the Andrew Claven YouTube channel. Uh, there is uh, exclusive material there that you will be able to uh, look at and say, gee, I, that's exclusive material. I didn't know that. And you will be very happy to get it. We, I will deliver it personally uh, to your home uh, by throwing it through your window. And so nobody will know what you're getting. I'll wrap it in porn so it'll look um, It'll look innocent, more innocent than my material. Also, if you leave a comment and the comment is sufficiently disgusting, racist, sexist, all the other things, we will read it on the show because that's what we do here. Today's comment is from Susan Epp 2707, who says, Mr. Clavin, how'd you get so smart? Well, I mean, I'm not sure you don't mean smart ass. That's very flattering. Uh, but really, it's not a question of being that smart. I just question my own premises a lot. And I try to make sense. And I also never let my ideas uh, get in the way of reality. I try to let reality get in the way of my ideas. And that, that's the answer to as smart as I am. That's how, why. Let's get to today's episode, The Next Great American Culture. Many years ago, I wrote a novel called The Uncanny, which is a very important novel in my career. Uh, one of the characters in it says something like this. I'm quoting from memory, but she says something like this. Small minds think great thoughts, but great minds proceed by the smallest of stages. Small minds think great thoughts, but great minds proceed by the smallest of stages. And these words have stuck in my head ever since I wrote them, and they have come to seem to be more and more true to me and more and more important, especially when I look online and see endless small minds thinking great thoughts. And some of these great thoughts are conspiracies, right? Everything makes sense, and everything fits together, and everybody is in cahoots with one another doing things. Just over the past few days, I saw the CDC was organized an Ebola pandemic through Burning Man, and Whoopi Goldberg was pretending to have COVID so the government could bring back mask mandates instead of the fact that Whoopi Goldberg, who I don't like at all, but she probably has COVID, uh, and every single person who dies young was killed by the COVID vaccine. You see this. Everybody's got a theory how everything, everything is all being worked out in front of us, and there almost is no reality. These are big thoughts finding a pattern of meaning in a chaotic way chaotic world and then looking for big solutions or just falling down in helplessness or looking to Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis to save them because they are not thinking the small things that would make life worthwhile and make them happy so they wouldn't be thinking these things like asking questions like, what am I doing today? <laughs> and what's the purpose of what I'm doing with my life? And what does it mean what I'm doing right this minute? Am I doing it right? And so on. So we're obviously going through a period of mass psychopathology. Uh, I would call it, um, you know, a, a genuine mass lunacy. And as always, one of the key presenting symptoms of lunacy are sexual problems. Almost always, one of the first things to appear when you're going mad is something is wrong with your sex life. And there's a reason that societies in decline are always portrayed in the movies, whether it's ancient Rome or the Hunger Game uh, society. They're always depicted as being full of sexual confusion, uh, homosexuality, uh, cross-dressing, and immorality. It's because when people lose the plot and purpose of their own individual lives, uh, and wait for something big to come along and save them, a lot of times it comes out relationally, and our biggest, most central relation is usually the sexual relationship we have with someone we love. I couldn't help myself, speaking of sex, I couldn't help myself watch, but I had to watch Tucker Carlson interview this guy, Larry Sinclair, who as he told the story about how in 1999, uh, he hooked up with then state Senator Barack Obama. Uh, they took cocaine, uh, Sinclair says he snorted it and Obama smoked it. Uh, they were in the back of a limo and then Sinclair gave Obama oral sex. Here is clip uh, 14. I start to put a line on a, on a CD tray and I just happened to notice that he pulls something else out of his pocket. And next thing I know, he's got a little pipe and he's smoking. So I don't have an issue with it. I mean, some people smoke, some people snort. Smoking the cocaine. Yes. So as I'm doing a line, I just start 
this is the part where you, you know, you kind of make your move to, to see where things are going. So I just started rubbing my hand along his thigh to see where it was going. And it went the direction I had intended it to go. So I have no idea whether this is true or not. And guess what? Neither do you. I'd like it to be true because I like the idea of Barack Obama being a sleaze bag uh, in the back of a limo smoking crack and getting blown. But I can't tell you, the guy. this guy also looks like a bit of a con man. He's been convicted of, of being a con man. And, uh, and so I have no idea whether the story is true. But the, the encounter, which is a kind of encounter that used to be at least very common among gay people because they didn't, they weren't allowed to have open relationships. And so these were the kind of encounters, this meaningless, sleazy sexual encounter with a virtual stranger is something that used to be really only for female prostitutes and gay people who were excluded from uh, a sort of open sexual life. And yet now it is something that I hear more and more from young women that this is what a date looks like, that you meet a guy and he expects on the first date to sleep with you and even to do uh, really strange things with you. And the reason, of course, for this is when you strip women of their magisterium, of their realm of uh, where they rule, which is the realm of creating and nurturing life and building homes, they essentially, and you give them chemicals to make them sterile, they essentially become, uh, in, in a way, gay men. I remember that watching that movie. I never really saw a whole episode of that show, Sex in the City, but I turned it on once and I listened for about 10 minutes and I thought, these aren't women talking. These are gay men, writers, writing dialogue for women. And that actually turned out to be the truth. We are in a moment when people are utterly lost in the little things that make up real life. And that's why I think there are no good movies, no good TV shows, there's no good music, because we no longer have re any real sense what life is about. Whoever remembers what life is about will be the person and the group that create the next great American culture. And there will be one. Don't worry about that. I know a lot of conservatives love to give up and love to say, oh, it's all over. It's not all over. There is, will be a new great American culture, and it will be made by those people who remember what life is about. So that's what I want to talk about today is finding meaning in ordinary life. Think about how much you use your phone and how much information is in there. The scary part is that your phone carrier collects data on whatever it is you're doing. They say it so they can better understand your interests, but really all they want is to sell your activity to advertisers. Stuff like the sites you visited, what you've been up to online, the more they can get on you, the larger their paycheck becomes, which is why I use ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is an app that prevents your phone carrier from being able to see the sites you visit and sell it off to third parties. All it takes is one tap of a button and all of your network data gets encrypted and rerouted through ExpressVPN's secure servers for ultimate privacy. Not only does it shield your web browsing, but ExpressVPN protects all of your network data so you can stay private even when using your favorite apps. ExpressVPN works on all your devices. The best part is one subscription can be used on up to five devices at the same time. When your phone carrier tracks you, that's a gross invasion of your privacy. You can either keep letting them cash in on you or visit expressvpn.com slash Claven. Use my link at expressvpn.com slash Claven to get three extra months free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Claven. And I know you're asking, how do you spell VPN? It's K-L-A-V-A-N or something like that. Chapter one, no hard feelings. Now there's something I really dislike in conservative culture that has become kind of common, which is our new habit of ridiculing and attacking ordinary women who are living badly. They're collecting sexual experiences and what they call a body count, and then they get confused why no decent man wants to sleep with them after they've slept with a hundred guys, and they get they feel that they've been cheated somehow and they're being mistreated in some way, or they feel that. Uh, they're in some meaningless job that they were told was going to be fulfilling and it's not fulfilling and now they're running out of time to have children uh, or they're angry all the time or, they, or men are mistreating them or whatever. And then the right has them on these shows. You've seen these shows and we've seen it online and everything where they start to tease them and make fun of them for their essentially empty, meaningless lives because they lived a feminist life. And what's wrong about this? See, conservatives are so clueless about culture. What's wrong about this is people are born into a culture and it's the atmosphere that they breathe. They don't know 
most people do not st- stand up and say, you know, everything we're doing is wrong. We need to change. I'm going to live in a totally different way. I don't care what my friends are doing. I don't care, uh, you know, what my sister and brothers are doing. I, I'm going to live a totally unique and original life. People don't do that. Most people do not do that. Those are, those are for different individuals and sometimes better, sometimes worse individuals. Most people live in the culture that they're not. And these girls are not the, to blame for feminism. They're the victims of feminism. And instead of attacking them, I think we have to create a positive culture and a positive series of images for them to live in. And I don't think we're doing it. I don't think we're doing a very good job. Some of us are trying, but not all of us, uh, but not in, in the, the bigger way, because we too grew into this culture and it needs a revolutionary idea to bring us into something else. You know, I streamed a movie this week called No Hard Feelings. I don't know if you've heard of it. It was an old fashioned kind of sex comedy. Just It just came out. I don't know if it did very well, but it had Jennifer Lawrence in it. Uh, she plays an Uber driver who loses her car and she's afraid of losing her house in Montauk because Montauk is being gentrified. So people like her are being priced out. And she plays a character who's damaged by her father's absence. Uh, She has an empty sex life. She's promiscuous and she sleeps with anybody uh, and she's miserable and she ghosts anybody who starts to have feelings for her. Anytime anybody uh, becomes affectionate, truly affectionate to her, she gets rid of him. Uh, And she can't leave Montauk because part of her is waiting for her father. She was, she's a, what, she's fatherless or her mother had an affair with this married guy and he doesn't want anything to do with her or with the the baby. And so he never appears. And yet Jennifer Lawrence's character is sort of stuck in this house because she's waiting for daddy to come home, which he's never going to do. And she's exactly, in fact, the sort of girl that conservatives have on their shows and then yell at and make fun of. So in exchange for a new car, she makes a deal with two rich helicopter parents to, quote unquote, date their son, who's a nervous, uh, so closed off. He's almost artistic and he practically lives in his room. And here she makes this deal as cut to. We've just been so worried about our son. He's going to Princeton in the fall. No, I've heard of it. You know, we tried everything to bring him out of his shell. He doesn't come out of his room. He doesn't talk to girls, doesn't drink. So when you say date him, do you mean date him or date him? Yes. Date him. Date him hard. Okay. I'll date his brains out. <laughs> so she wants to, they want her to have sex with him, but the kid doesn't want meaningless sex. He's a sensitive little guy and he wants a relationship. And slowly the two of them become friends and, you know, you can, you can figure it all out. Uh, now, despite a lot of foul language and a graphic nude scene in which a spectacularly gorgeous naked Jennifer Lawrence beats up a couple of kids, it's pretty funny. Uh, a lot of conservatives like this picture because of its values. A, fe- a federal is just choosing one of the articles I saw uh, by Aaron Gleason. It was called Coming of Age Comedy, No Hard Feelings, Gets Sex Right. He says, lack of originality, notwithstanding, because a very old fashioned kind of movie. This film is interesting because of the complexities of contempt, because the complexities of contemporary young adult life are portrayed with such subtle despair to the point where it crosses the line from sex comedy into sex tragedy. And I actually had the same experience. After this comedy was over, I found myself actually depressed because, you know, for instance, there's this one scene where Jennifer Lawrence, who's 32 in the she, in the movie, uh, and so these kids, these uh, high school kids look at her like she's their mom. You know, they think she's an old woman. And she walks into this teen party looking for this boy. And the teen party is just depicted as this solipsistic, sexless, woke humorless existence. Everybody is filming themselves on their own phones. Here's just a bit of it. Uh, cut one. Yo, yo, what's going on, you guys? It's your boy, Cameron B. We are kicking the summer off right at a sick house party in Montauk. Now me. Yo, what's up? It's me, Trash Gucci. If you or someone you know is being bullied, never be afraid to speak up. Bullying is not a hey, Yo, excuse me, ma'am. Can you not do that while we're recording, please? Thank you. Just getting a beer, Frosted. Just come Frosted. And that, my friends, is what we call a bully, huh? Oh, no, not a phone. Someone held but being filled, man. You're so mean. Oh, how old are you? 23. Damn, you're old as f. No disrespect. He loves cool girls. <laughs> the big cats. Well, why don't you two big cats f each other then? Whoa! Hold is up. that an Fine. insult? It sure is, Professor. Why is us having f- with each other an insult? Say what you just said. Say that again. No, I didn't mean it at homophobic. How'd you mean it then? It was a joke. I'm not. I've been with girls. I'm not. I'm not homophobic. <laughs> so the sex has become so meaningless that there's nothing that you know. When she's held, told, 
tells these two straight guys that they must be sleeping together as an insult. What they're insulted by is that she would say anything mean about gay people. So that's the only value they have, but they have no values about their bodies. Uh, she goes through from room to room searching for this boy, and everybody's in their bedroom with uh, with phones. And she says, doesn't anybody have sex anymore? Sex is plentiful, and it's meaningless. And in the end, uh, Jennifer and this boy form a friendship, which is the only meaning they have. But what's depressing about the film is there's no thought about what sex might look like and why. A conservative, uh, you know, we get all this conservative Christian happy talk about the joys of marriage, but they don't. that doesn't really solve the problem and it's actually not having any effect because marriage does have joys, but it also has real sacrifices and real disciplines. Uh, you know, men give up something when they marry. They give up the joy of promiscuity, which is very important to men. It's a real yearning that men have and women give up something, which is the, the world. They feel that they're missing out on living in the exciting world of work, which they didn't realize was a bore. So you, you, marriage does not replace the dating life. Marriage is something different, and we have no vision. We're not giving people telling stories in which there's a vision of marriage that has the meaning that makes all those sacrifices worthwhile. So before I go on with my own thoughts, I want to stop and talk to somebody who's closer to dating age than I am. All you have to do is take one look at me to know that poor sleep can cause weight gain, mood issues, poor mental health, and lower productivity. Sleep is the foundation of our mental and physical health and performance in our days. Having a consistent nighttime routine is non-negotiable. If you're struggling with sleep, check out Beam. Beam's top-selling Beam Dream has a new formula. Dream contains a powerful all-natural blend of reishi, L-theanine, and apigenin to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and help you wake up refreshed. Just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir or froth and enjoy before bedtime. And today, my listeners get a special discount on Beam's delicious Dream Powder, their best-selling hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. It's now available in delicious flavors like cinnamon cocoa and chocolate peanut butter. Better sleep has never tasted better. If you want to try Beam's best-selling Dream Powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash Clavin and use code Clavin at checkout. That's shop B-E-A-M.com slash Clavin and use code Clavin for up to 40% off. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking B-E-A-M. I didn't need that. I need to know how to spell Clavin. How do you do it? There's no E's in Clavin. I just make it look easy. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no E's in Clavin. All right. Chapter two, date them hard. I'm going to talk today to Hannah Claire Brimelow. She's a writer and reporter for TimCast, our friends over at TimCast News. She covers politics, culture, digital trends. But most importantly, she's actually young enough to still be in the dating world as opposed to me. I'm just barely in the world at all. Uh, Hannah Claire, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, you know, we've been talking before you got here, we were talking about the fact that, you know, women, a lot of women are unhappy and more and more women seem to be unhappy, according to polls. And yet conservatives kind of invite these ladies on and they yell at them for being unhappy and for living in this world. And I want to get a feel for what it is like now to be in the dating world. I assume you are dating from time to time, at least. I am. I'm still on the hunt for the husband. Uh, My dad is really ready for me to settle down. Uh, It's it's challenging. You know, I've always been conservative. And so when you go into university, you're actually not as likely to find someone who matches your ideology. Uh, not that you have to be identical, but it's nice people to share some common ground. And I think it's true that conservative women or women generally are under a lot of pressure to uh, to date successfully when ultimately it's uh, not always up to them. There are, of course, women who are raised by feminists. I think the majority of women uh, in of every generation identify as feminists. A few research poll from a couple of years ago, but ultimately men have to want marriage too men have to hold women and themselves to a high standard uh i don't know if you saw but about a week ago the guardian released a piece on uh childless men and the number one thing the headline it ran with was i just assumed it would happen so if we expect women to date for marriage we should expect men to do the same thing so the two the two things i i hear a lot and i observe some of this too one of them is men are angry they feel that, you know, they've been 
disrespected. They've, they've been called toxic. Uh, they've been told that women and men are exactly the same. And when they find out that women are totally different, they're sort of disappointed. Is that something you run into or is that just, uh, you know, news fodder? Truth to it. I think ultimately men and women are uh, bred to be at odds right now by feminism and sort of the response from the manosphere, which says that you can't trust the other gender, you can't trust them to have your back, that you can't trust them to be faithful. Uh, and I think ultimately it encourages men and women not to communicate openly because it becomes about who can get what I want from the other person, right? You'll have uh, manosphere figures saying, well, women should be submissive and they're really for sex and you don't need to be faithful. And you'll have women, you know, uh, feminist leaders telling young women men just want to lock you in the house with tons of children and never let you be independent and i think that's the worst part of humanity right we should have faith in one another and in ourselves to pick partners who are compassionate and who lift us up to be the best we can uh but it's not the culture that people are dating in so i could understand where on top of their financial concerns you know uh marriage downturns during any depression or recession uh, people are not thinking that dating is a worthwhile venture, and they're not particularly optimistic about the candidates out there. So I, I've been married for over 40 years, uh, and it has been bliss. It has been one of the, it's been a fairy tale marriage. So I'm some, I sometimes feel that I'm a, it's a little hard for me to identify with the problem. However, the thing that I didn't have noticed about marriage, being in one so long, is that, that men give up a, a certain thing that is very dear to them, which is variety and sex. You're giving up, you know, the fact that you're playing the field, which men care about a lot and they have this great urge to do. In return for that, I received a home, which I would never have had on my own. I res received a family. I received a world in which I was the respected father of a family. Is that still on offer for men, or are they just being asked to give something up without getting anything in return? I think it really depends on who you date, right? I mean, I can tell you some people more than others, and I can put them on a political spectrum, think homemaker is a dirty word, and it really shouldn't be. Uh, I can understand what women fear men who won't live up to their end of the bargain, right? If you're going to stay home and raise children and be sort of uh, the one in charge of keeping the nuclear family unit together, you need a man who's going to work hard and provide for you. You need someone who's going to be faithful. But the trade-off shouldn't be something that deter people. You know, life is about sacrifice, and hopefully the things that you give up give you innumerable joy uh, because of it. Uh, women, you know, they'll say, I give up my independence, I'm giving up my potential career, things like that. But your legacy that you have to your family, your family unit is ultimately more impor important. Now, do I think modern dating culture asks you to ask these questions? No, modern dating culture is about the dopamine hits, seeing how many matches you get on the dating app, seeing how many people you can get to like you on Instagram. It's just uh, a process that doesn't make sense for the end goal if your end goal is to be in a strong and long marriage. Mm, so, okay, so that that's a, a good question then. If a woman, I get this letter all the time, actually. People say, where do I find somebody with my values? How do you meet people after you're out of school? It's a great question. I know people feel it socially on a lot of levels, not just romantic. Um, you know, if we look to Gen Z, they're actually getting off dating apps. They're more likely to be uh, connecting with people through Instagram or Facebook. Uh, I think especially after COVID, I personally saw the rise in matchmaking. I had so many friends suddenly saying, could you please introduce me to someone or, uh, you know, do you know someone who might be right for me? And I think that return to community is really important. Uh, I had heard this joke once that everybody in the 80s met through a mutual friend they immediately lost contact with. Well, where were they meeting? They were going to community events, they're going to church, they're having dinner parties, you know, they interacted with one another. And I think uh, people who are dating now are right to follow that path. Your community is going to help you if your community reflects your values. So the, the other thing that I hear, which is a little hard for me to digest, but I, I believe it, I, I hear from women that that basically when, it, when I was a young man a hundred years ago, no was the default for sex. And you worked your way, hopefully, to sleeping with girls you liked, which was all, all often difficult because the girls who would sleep with you were not the girls you liked and the girls you liked were not the girls who would sleep with you. But I, I hear stories now where like on a first date, guy, guys will actually ask, to choke women, which is something after 40 years of marriage, I still haven't gotten to the point where I'm choking my wife. I don't think either of us would like it very much. Uh, but 
Uh, is this is that what you're dealing with? I mean, are you dealing with guys who say, "Oh yeah, I want to marry a virgin, but I want to sleep with you," uh, or it, it, you know, how how do you how do you manage that, and how do you compete in that field? Sure, I think it is what I think. We use the term dating, and people think of these relationships, but really it means how quickly can we sleep together? And I don't think that's what a lot of people want long term. Again, it's a momentary dopamine hit, right? You, you meet someone, you feel attracted. If you go to bed with them right away, maybe on some level you're getting some gratification. And that's definitely what sex positive feminism sells. And it's selling the same product that a lot of the manosphere is selling uh, that your sexual gratification is ultimately what makes you happy when we know that's not true. Uh, And to me, this is the problem with the birth control pill. Birth control pill completely destroyed dating because it made it so that casual sex is more accessible. And so instead of interacting with them on a way in in, uh, attempts to make a long relationship or at least have a healthy short term relationship, however long it lasts, it was about how quickly can we uh, convert any kind of conversation, any kind of interaction into sex. I mean, there are teenagers who send nude pictures of themselves to people they're not dating. That tells us that ultimately we think our interactions with the other gender are supposed to be about sex which i fundamentally don't believe sex is a great part of a healthy marriage but it's not the point of dating again if you want to be married if you just want to sleep around then modern culture is great for you and you probably shouldn't tell me you're depressed because you get you're getting what you asked for so let's talk about birth control for a minute because now this is not the first time i've heard this of women of intelligence saying this is actually a bad thing what is a world without birth control look like exactly? Um, it does, do you use birth control but not chemical birth control? Or are you abstinent? What what's the, what's the system there? I mean, ultimately, everyone's free to make their own choices. I think that uh, hormonal birth control is something that we don't talk about enough and that the young women who are put on it are not born to talk because it does disrupt your hormones. So therefore, it disrupts your brain chemistry and your attraction to men. Uh, you'll hear tons of studies coming out that your sense of smell changes when you get off birth control. And, you know, pheromones play a huge part of attraction. Um, you know, I think especially for young, like, let's say below the age of 20, abstinence is absolutely uh, the better idea because you don't necessarily know the long term consequences of your actions. Uh, I can't tell anyone, you know, I really can't tell adults what to do. I would just say that uh, in my entire life with all of my female friends, no one is warned about the risks of depression, which uh, increase exponentially if you start taking birth control below the age of 20. Uh, and that's hormonal birth control. So again, I think that a world without birth control is difficult to, ma- to imagine. I know it was a great time, especially for families that couldn't afford to have, you know, 10, 12, 11 children. On the other hand, this thing that might have been positive in some contexts is u- misused and abused and overprescribed to women to the point of toxicity, in my opinion. Yeah, everything comes with a price. Um, yeah. You've mentioned feminism in a negative way oftentimes, and I think feminism is a genuinely big mistake. I mean, I'm, insofar as it's about women having human rights, of course, it's just human rights. But insofar as it's feminism, it seems to me to have adopted male values. It seems to me to be saying to women that you're not actually successful unless you're successful as a man would be successful. Uh, is that something you hear a lot, or are you kind of alone in saying this? As I've been more open about my particular, and I've really been openly anti-feminist, I do not identify as feminist, I haven't since I was 14, and someone asked me, don't you think women should vote? Uh, You know, the question is, are we asking for women to be treated equally and fairly in a healthy and safe way, or are we saying that gender doesn't matter and you should expect the same behaviors and activities and results from everyone involved? And that's not true. Men and women are fundamentally different. We know this, you can see studies in the way uh, young infants, infants who are less than 24 hours old, react to objects versus faces. I mean, there is such a deep difference between men and women that a society that doesn't acknowledge that is doing a disservice to both genders. And again, I think is breeding resentment because we are expecting men and women to operate in the same way and we are not training each other to learn the differences. I mean, I know the reason that that book, uh, it was by uh, John Gray, Men is from Mars, Women are from Venus, is so popular is because it was a fundamental statement that we are not the same, we barely speak the same language. Uh, And I think that ultimately drives this idea that if you can accept someone for not being like you, you're able to really work to get to know someone in a way that breeds deep emotional connection. If you just see them as an object 
is a means to end, then of course you put your sexual gratification above everything else. But once again, we're talking to Hannah Claire Bremelow, who is a writer and reporter on cultural matters for our friends over at Timcast News. Uh, Hannah Claire, one of the things that I, I have found appalling is the popularity of Andrew Tate and his ilk, uh, who basically have discovered what most men have always known, that women can be manipulated, but thinks that's a good thing. That's the, that's the difference. I mean, obviously, people can always be manipulated, but he basically says that's what constitutes manhood. What I'm interested in is how, how popular is that idea? I mean, is that something you actually run into, or is it just something that, again, makes the news? I think you run into it in men that are seeking uh, lessons. I think it's uh, what I've learned, you know, Andrew Tate is a successful businessman. He's obviously built himself an empire. And men who feel as though cultural tells them that their instincts, their natural masculine tendencies are bad, might be looking for someone to tell them, hey, no, you're good the way you are. And in that sense, I can understand why he's appealing. On the other hand, no man that I know who ultimately treats women respectfully, who are in healthy marriages, says you should listen to Andrew Tate, right? <laughs> I don't think we should take advice from a pornographer who's not married. You know, business advice, maybe he has a lot of money, apparently. But if you don't want that kind of lifestyle, if you're actually seeking a meaningful marriage, then why would he be your icon? Uh, but he did feel a vacuum for a lot of people who are looking for guidance. And again, we should point to feminism and also our general culture of selfishness who made that vacuum possible, right? He is just saying you should put your needs above everything else and you can get things from people. And that's what feminism, uh, feminism is saying. They're saying that you should not think that you should have to sacrifice your family, your career, your personal identity. Everything about yourself and your own needs should be more important than everything else. And I don't love that, you know? Yeah. Uh, so my last question, uh, are you hopeful about finding someone, hopeful about getting married, or you're sitting at home with a whiskey and just staring into your glass? Oh, yeah, my scotch over here. No. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, to be honest. And I've always been a hopeless romantic, but my parents had a really, uh, you know, loving marriage until my mom passed away when I was fairly young. And I see this in my friends who go into marriage, even my friends who got married right out of college. Uh, when you have a person of high value, both a man and a woman, marriage can be such a beautiful institution and it can really add both to your personal life and to your community. And I never hear the, my friends who say, well, I don't want to get married, typically have just gotten out of really terrible relationships, with really terrible guys. You know, my friends who have found really loving and respectful guys never say, well, I don't want to get married. They always pursue marriage. And so I think that we are naturally drawn to find each other and to build communities from the the marital uh, from building blocks of marriage to family to community outwards. So I'm hopeful, but again, maybe I'm just a hopeless romantic. <laughs> On that upbeat note, Hannah Claire Brimelow, writer and reporter for Timcast News. It's really nice talking to you. I hope we get to talk again. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. With everything going on in the world right now, you could really use a good night's sleep. And if you get one, let me know what it's like. That's why you need to check out Helix Mattress. The Helix lineup offers 20 unique mattresses, including the award-winning Lux Collection, the newly released Helix Elite Collection, a mattress designed for big and tall sleepers, and even a mattress made just for kids. I've had my Helix for years now. I love it, and I get to experience a lot because I'm awake all night. Helix has a sleep that matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress because why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? Go to helixsleep.com slash Clavin. Take their two-minute sleep quiz to find the perfect mattress for your body and sleep type. Their flexible payment plans make it so that a great night's sleep is never far away. Helix is offering 25% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners in honor of Labor Day. Go to helixsleep.com slash Clavin and use code HELIXPARTNER25. This is their best offer yet. It won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Chapter 3, Burning Man. Now, without relationships and without understanding the meaning of relationships and what we're doing when we have sex or when we uh, sit and have dinner, whichever we're doing, uh, you know, without that key male-female relationship on which society depends, because it's not only the source of life, it's also the source of organization and freedom, uh, life just becomes a series of big ideas. And that's why I'm very, very suspicious of big ideas. It's not just the conspiracy theories, uh, but it's also these ideas of how you're going to fix everything. You're going to fix the world. It's really, uh, you know, 
it's those it's those big ideas that actually make things work. So, you know, freedom and capitalism work on small ideas. I have an idea for a store that sells books online. I have an idea for uh, a way of streaming movies on TV. Those are the ideas that come up in in freedom and in socialism. Uh, it, but in freedom and in capitalism and socialism and globalism, those are those big ideas. Uh, you know, everything's going to be paradise. Everything's going to be great. And that's why we laughed when Burning Man f- flooded this week. Uh, you know, the, the week, you know, we didn't not only laugh then, the week before, I don't know if you remember this, there were climate protesters out on the road that were going to block the only road in and out of Burning Man in uh, Nevada. And then the tribal police came on and ran them off. Here's a bit of that. Get out now! Get out! On the ground! All of you on the ground now! Get on the ground! Get on the ground! Don't move! Please! Molly, give me your last name and So who's going to get the gun? No one, one has a gun. We have no weapons at all. Officer, we tell me where you We're environmental from. protesters. <laughs> <laughs> we have no weapons. We're environmental protesters. You know, when your individual life, when you don't have a life that makes sense and has meaning, that's what you go for. You go for those big ideas that are going to make you important and a hero. And she's not. You know, she's this person sitting in the middle of an empty road. And so we laughed at that. You know, but th- but these big ideas are, are everywhere, especially among people who want power and people want to be important. You got Bill Gates. He's going to bioengineer the world. He's going to spread chemicals in the sky. That are to dim the sun. This is actually an idea that Bill Gates has now that Jeffrey Epstein's dead and he can't get the you know underage girls anymore. He's going to dim the sun. Thank you very much. Joe Biden is going to destroy the oil industry and you know will have net zero emissions. Tony Blair wants vaccine mandates. Here's one of my favorites. There's a bioethicist. Uh, what's his name? Matthew Lau. He's got an idea how to save the planet uh, from by stopping people from eating meat. Uh, cut six. 18% of greenhouse gas emissions come from livestock farming. So if we eat less meat, we could significantly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Now, some people would be willing to eat less meat, but they lack the willpower. Human engineering could help. <laughs> Just as some people are naturally intolerant to milk or crayfish, like myself, we could artificially induce mild intolerance to meat (laughs) by stimulating our immune system against common uh, bovine proteins. I mean, this is is what people are actually thinking about. They're often Davos. They're going to control everybody. They're going to make sure everybody gets a a pill that has a little beeper in it that tells them you took it. So in, in Switzerland, they'll know when you took your pill in New York. These these big ideas, which are really, really, really destructive, they never, ever solve anything and they really don't um, make life better because, of course, they don't take into account the fact that individuals want to make their own choices and do their own thing. They don't even believe in individual choices. They've lost the plot of small life. They've lost because they don't believe there's a meaning to life. It's just making, you know, making adjustments. I'll, I'll, it's getting a little hot. I'll dim the sun. That'll that'll help. They don't actually understand what life is or what people is. And so, you know, we laugh when these environmental protesters and, and cheered because it was a tr- it was tribal police who cleared the way into Burning Man. And so they couldn't attack them. The press couldn't attack them as being anti the environment because they're tribal. So you have to be nice to the tribal police. So so conservatives are cheering about this. Yeah. Thank heavens for the tribal police clearing the road. Into Burning Man, this orgy of, uh, you know, drugs and sex in the middle of nowhere that is just as as bad, uh, you know, just as bad a big idea. It's this big idea that we're all going to be self-reliant. And it really is a collection of very, very rich people pretending to be self-reliant. They, you know, they come in there with all their camp stuff and their, all their food and everything. And then it gets rained on, so it's hilarious. Now we're laughing at that, so we're laughing at the uh, organization. I have to say, it made me laugh, too, because 
it's kind of a, it's a pagan festival. They set up fire to a big burning man at the end, and they are, they're out there uh, on the playa, which is a dried up lake bed. And the way they talk about it, there was one article by Corey Doctorow. Uh, he, he was talking about how bad, because it rained and it flooded the, the playa. And he said, though such rainstorms are all but unheard of, harsh weather at Burning Man is absolutely normal. I've been caught in at least one whiteout dust storm every year. This is how the playa teaches patience. Whatever pleasurable thing you find yourself doing is every bit as fun as the thing you were planning to do, so enjoy it. This is how the playa teaches solidarity. So the earth is going to teach them how to live. You know, I couldn't help but think when I, whenever I hear about Burning Man, I can't help but think of the film The Wicker Man, a famous film from the 1970s. Uh, it was written, it's a really good movie, actually. It was written by Anthony Schaffer, uh, who wrote the terrific mystery play Sleuth. If you've never seen that, you should get the original film with Laurence Olivier and Michael Caine. Uh, he's the brother of uh, Anthony Schaffer, who wrote uh, Amadeus and Equus. Anyway, the film is about a... Uh, fundamentalist Christian police officer who comes to an island where he suspects human sacrifices are being made to a pagan god, who is, and they put the human sacrifice in a tremendous wicker man and set it on fire. And a lot of the pleasure of the film and the interest of the film comes from the confrontation between this uptight cop played by Edward Woodward and the relaxed but homicidal uh, leader of this pagan group played by Christopher Lee, and at one point they're looking out the window and these nude women go jumping over fires and the cop is scandalized. And here's the scene between the cop and Christopher Lee, cut three. Now, those children out there, they're jumping through the flames in the hope that the god of fire will make them fruitful. Really, you can hardly blame them. After all, what girl would not prefer the child of a god to that of some acne-scarred artisan? And, and you, you encourage them in this? Actively. It's most important that each new generation born on summer I'll be made aware that here the old gods aren't dead. And what of the true god? To whose glory churches and monasteries have been built on these islands for generations past. Now, sir, what of him? Well, he's dead. He can't complain. He had his chance, and in modern parlance, blew it. He, he blew it. And I can't help but watch a scene and feel that Christopher Lee has a point. First of all, there is no way that this sourpussed cop uh, who is so scandalized by naked women is going to win a contest of selling his ideas with this happy, uh, free-thinking you know, guy who's cheering for uh, naked young people. That's simply going to be more appealing because if your philosophy is don't do this, don't do that, and not scandalized, and don't be naked, and don't have sex, and don't have fun, that's just not a big sale. And I couldn't help but think when I see, when I saw churches closing at the behest of government during the pandemic, when I saw them folding up like dead weasels, basically, and oh, if you want us to close, then we won't have mass, we won't eat the body and blood of Christ. I, I, and when I see them open up again, and they've got gay flags and uh, Black Lives Matter flags, not to say anything against gay people or, or Black Lives Matter, but they, they're supposed to be preaching Christ crucified, which has nothing to do with any, any of those things. I feel like the church has basically surrendered. It has surrendered to Burning Man. It's surrendered to this uh, pagan idea that the earth is all there is, and basically our sexuality is sort of a, a kind of a, a meaningless you know, but mis weirdly mystical, but also weirdly meaningless thing with no other, um, with no other meaning outside of itself and the pleasure that you experience in doing it. I feel like we've lost the argument and all Christians have is this kind of grim, uh, you know, this grim disapproval, but also laughing at people who are trying to do something else. At least the people at Burning Man aren't closing, at least, the, you know, like the churches did, at least they're not basically... Uh, disavowing their values like the churches have. So I think in this final chapter, I would like to take a look at what, how maybe we start to build a culture that's, that can put forward these ideas again, maybe in a new way, but maybe old ideas uh, suited for a modern world. So let's go to our final chapter, What Do We Mean? When running a business, your employees can create all kinds of problems. Just look at this show. My God, that's why you better talk to Bambi. Bambi gives you access to your own dedicated HR manager starting at just $99 
per month. This person is available to you by phone, email, real-time chat. They'll help you run employee onboarding, terminations, and performance reviews. With Bambi's HR Autopilot feature, you can automate important HR practices like setting policies, employee training, and feedback procedures. All of Bambi's HR managers are based in the U.S. and can support the nuances across all 50 states. HR managers can easily cost $80,000 a year, but Bambi starts at just $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Andrew Claven under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show, spelled B-A-M-B-E-E.com, Bambi.com. Type in Andrew Claven. How do you spell Andrew? It's K-L. A V A N. Now, I, I don't want to make this political because I'm not being political today. I do not think politics is going to save us. I don't think the next election is going to save us. I don't think it's going to damn us either, although certainly the left can do a lot more damage than it has done and will if we act stupidly, as I suspect we probably will because we're the stupid party. But I want to show you a clip of Vivek uh, Ramaswamy, and and I I don't support him. I don't think his ideas are good, but he does understand what the issue is because he's from Yale, and Yale people are are sociopaths like Knowles, but they do understand things, and he does have an understanding of why conservatism dies all the time, why it doesn't seem to gain any cultural ground. So here he is discussing this in an interview. This is cut nine. So if they're giving us race, gender, sexuality and climate, I think we would do better to talk more about the value of the individual, the family, the nation and God. I think individual, family, nation, God beats race, gender, sexuality and climate. And so far in the Republican Party, we have a bunch of partisan hacks that recite slogans. They're handed down in a binder, criticize them. What do they teach us even for the debate? What are the debate Mm -hmm. standard debate wisdom and preparation is? You look at the super PAC leak of, you know, the uh, which one was it was the DeSantis camp that had their super PAC leak, their memo, criticize Biden at least three to five times. And that's the traditional advice that all the candidates will get. The way I look at it is, first of all, it's super robotic. But second of all, you're missing the point. If you're criticizing Biden, he's a puppet. Yeah. Zelensky's a puppet. Biden's a puppet. We have to actually have a vision of our own. See, see, that's just true. I mean, not the part where he's dissing everybody else. Everybody's everybody's bought and paid for except for him. All that stuff is nonsense. But the idea that we have to have a vision of our own and listen to the things that he said. He said they have the climate and sexuality. We have the individual family and God. And those are small ideas. And you say, well, God is, the, is a big idea, but not really because God only is important insofar as is only active insofar as he's in your life. So he's about your life. God, a relationship with God is about your life. It's not something the whole world is going to do. It never was. If you go back and read the gospel, you find out that they were arguing, they were arguing with people even then about what they were saying. The Greek thought it was foolishness and the Jews thought it was a stumbling block, but they were saying, no, this is a personal relationship with God. Conservatives live to attack what other people are doing, but they don't create. They, they really do not. And it's not like ever, there's not like there are no great conservative creators. It is simply that they allow the industry of creation at, uh, to be taken over by the left. So, again, small minds think great thoughts. Great minds proceed by the smallest of stages. And the reason this line, I think, is as true as I've found it to be is that it turns out to be good gospel wisdom. Whenever Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, he emphasizes the fact that it's small, that the kingdom of heaven is a mustard seed. It's like a little bit of yeast. It's like a small pearl, a single pearl. He always does this. And he always says, yes, it's mustard seeds, the smallest thing, but it grows into a tree in which life can thrive. It's like a little bit of yeast, just a little bit, but the entire bread rises when it's there. It's like a small pearl, but you sell everything else you have to get your hands on it. So the point, I guess, is that whenever small things start to have meaning, Everything starts to have meaning, and this is what's called, or what I will call, the symbolic life. I didn't make that up, but I think it's a a pretty good phrase for it. Uh, It's when the nursing of a baby, or the doing of a job, or doing laundry, or having sex has meaning. How do you do it? What does it mean? Well, first of all, let's talk about what symbolism is. Symbolism is when an object represents a truth, when something material represents something 
an idea that's immaterial and we can't we can't fully experience the truth without the material thing but the material thing is not the truth they, basically symbolism is the opposite of idolatry when you have a a statue of a god and you think that it is the god and you start to think oh this is a holy object that's idolatry but when you have something that reminds you of a god like for instance you uh, have a have a crucifix and you say obviously this is not God but it reminds me it puts me in mind of God it communicates God to me that's symbolism it's a different thing language is symbolism all language is sim- symbolism the word tree is not a tree it represents the truth of a tree a tree is a, a word is an object basically it represents an idea that we have and so we can communicate it uh, we can communicate it to one another. The left has used this. The left doesn't actually understand it. It thinks the word is the thing. They are idolaters. That's what postmodernism is. It's the idea that the word is the thing. So therefore, if I change the word, it's going to change the thing. If instead of calling you a cripple, I call you uh, special or handicapped or something, it's going to change what you are. But no, the meaning just flows into the new word because the meaning is the thing and the word is just a symbol. A man doesn't become a woman by changing his pronouns. He doesn't That doesn't do a thing. He doesn't become a woman because you stop defining the word woman. All these things remain true. You've just destroyed the symbol. It's idolatry to think that by redefining women, men and women will cease to exist. That is the literal definition of idolatry. It's taking the object for the thing that it represents. But you also have to understand that the body itself is a symbol. And this is where living the symbolic life comes in. The body itself is a symbol of you. It's a symbol of a living soul. The body is linked to the self and has to be treated like the self. That's living a symbolic life. When I do, when I, the things that I do with my body represent the things that I do with myself. This is why with women, women and men are so different. You know, guys who sit around and say, oh, women don't like sex or women are, uh, don't get horny or, you know, women don't enjoy, don't have orgasms. They're just not doing it right. They don't understand that women do like sex and they do want to have sex and all that. But it's not the same as men. Men are driven. Men have to be in a constant state of self-control, of impulse control, because our sex drive is entirely different and entirely more uh, out there and powerful than a woman's sex drive. A woman's drive to simply have sex. And women don't like to acknowledge this. They think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not fair. It's not equal. Who cares? Nothing is fair. Nothing is equal. Men's sex drive is just inc- insanely powerful all through your life. I mean, obviously, you know, it goes down a little as you get older, but you're still constantly thinking about this one thing and constantly having to control yourself. So you're in two different situations. When a woman lets somebody into her body, she is allowing a relationship to begin because women sex for se- women sex is more relational than it is for men. She's allowing a relationship to begin. And so when she lets a lot of men into her, uh, into her body, you start to think like, oh, she doesn't really have respect for what is going on. She doesn't really understand that this is not just a physical thing. This symbolizes a relationship relationship. It is the, it is the uh, outward show of a relationship, and she has cheapened that relationship. Men have a different problem altogether. When they try to be faithful, when they become, uh, when, when they dedicate themselves to fidelity, they're giving something up. They're giving up this incredibly powerful urge that is identified with their manhood in their mind. That's why conservatives think Elon Musk is great, even though Elon Musk has had children by 10 different women. And they think, well, yeah, because a guy's going to Mars, you know, men have this uh, idea of of conquering and expanding. And they think, ah, yeah, Elon Musk is doing that with his body as well. But the fact is that sexual restraint in women is elevating and transformative and appealing because it shows what their bodies are representing to them, which is relationship. The, for men to control their sex drive, to dedicate themselves to fidelity, is to understand that conquering and expanding and seizing territory begins with themselves. The first thing they have to conquer is themselves. And the reason you do this, the meaning of this, is to establish love, the central love relationship. That is what you are honing yourself into. You are honing yourself into an object that can love. Now, love is a word that gets thrown around so much, so I'm going to define it for you. Love is understanding completely the reality of another person and including that person all the same in your ego, in the, the things that are good to you and bad to you. When you do that, when you do that, you begin to experience the world in a new way, and it leads to the possibility that you can experience the otherness of God and yet replace your ego 
with the ego of God. When you do this, you will live a life of joy. I believe that when you do this, you actually become an eternal character. You actually live into eternity, but you don't have to believe that because the joy that you do, that you have, when you start to understand the meaning of what you're doing, that a woman is essentially establishing love with her body, that a man is limiting himself to love with his body, that they are doing something different to get to the same place, you start to live in a way that it is simply joyful. When you love other individuals, when you include other individuals, the reality of individuals in your ego, you begin to learn how to do that with God. You begin to see that God is other than you, something besides you, something more than you, something greater than you, and you include that greater thing in yourself. You know, C.S. Lewis said that the most beautiful book in English was Centuries by Thomas Traherne. I read it all the time. And Thomas Traherne said that, um, he said, if you love God, angels and men, if you triumph in God's work, if you delight in God's laws, take pleasure in God's ways in all ages, correct sins, bring good out of evil, subdue your lust, order your senses, conquer the customs and opinions of men, and render good for evil, you are in heaven everywhere. Above the stars, earthly things will be celestial joys, and here beneath will things delight you that are above the heavens. All things being infinitely beautiful in their places and wholly yours in their places, your riches will be as infinite in value and excellency as they are in beauty and glory. That's the point of marriage. That's the point of dating. That's the point of sex. That's the thing you're trying to get to. And you can't do it without discipline. You can't do it without sacrifice. You can't do it without the work of love. But it is all worthwhile. Whether we love it or hate it, AI is here to stay. And AI is expected to create over 100 million new jobs globally. Some of those jobs will include data scientists, product designers, robotic engineers, and surprisingly, tax managers with AI skills. ZipRecruiter is the best way to use AI to help you find people with these skills. ZipRecruiter's AI identifies candidates who are best suited for all kinds of roles. Right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Clavin. Do you want the most qualified candidates? ZipRecruiter uses its powerful AI to find and send you people whose skills and experience match your job. Then ZipRecruiter lets you easily invite them to apply to encourage them to apply sooner. In fact, over 3.8 million businesses have come to ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. Get the leading edge on hiring with ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Clavin. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash Clavin. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. Type into AI. How do you spell Clavin? It will type back, you fool. There's no E's in Clavin. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. All right, Clavin clapbacks. <laughs> so you were left with a bad taste in your mouth. Uh, something, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. Not the best choice of words for Tucker Carlson on that one. All right, Clavin Clapax. Clavin is spelled with a K. Clapax is spelled with a K at dailywire.com. Send in your reactions to the show, uh, your opinions. If you agree with me or if you're wrong, it doesn't matter. We will read them on the air. This one is from Ken. He says, hello, Lord Clavin, banisher of ease. Since I'm apparently wrong about this, I'd like for you to at least tell me why I'm asking about the debate moment where you said that DeSantis lost for avoiding the question about January 6th. I think Fox asked a wrong question. I'm so over January 6th, uh, and I think that the majority of the Republican primary voter base is as well. Does my opinion change anything for you, or can you explain why my opinion is wrong? Well, you are wrong simply on the basis of the fact that, as I said would happen, uh, DeSantis's numbers tanked. They just collapsed greater after the debate. And I still think he has a chance to win. I think he has a chance to come back. But this was bad debate for him. And it was bad for the reasons that I said it was bad. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think is important. Part of being in a campaign is appearing to be the person that people will vote for. And you don't appear to be that way if you can't respond to the questions that you're asked. The press always asks stupid questions, shallow questions, gotcha questions, unfair questions. You got to be ready for them all. Nobody is going to blame the questioner. You might, but the people who vote are not going to blame the questioner. This is a thing that you are doing, which is trying to win the election. And he did it badly then. I hope he does it better because I think he would be a good president. I think he'd be a great president. And I think Trump will lose. That's what I think. I could be wrong about both, but that's what I believe. So I'd like to see him do better. 
from Brenton. Big fan of your show, Andrew, but listening to the member block section about being born gay was really disappointing. You tell us homosexuality is genetic. That's just not true. It's like saying adultery is genetic or stealing is genetic. No, it is not, because that would be, it would be like that if I said homosexual action is genetic. If I said being acting out your homosexual desires is genetic, but I meant the desires themselves. Most men don't want to sleep with other men. I've never spent a second thinking, hmm, that guy was really handsome. I wish I, you know, this doesn't happen. If you have, if you are born with that mindset, women are not attractive to you and men are. You don't fall in love with women. You fall in love with men. What you do with that is up to you. And what you do with that is up is something that you have to work out morally. But the, that it is genetic, I'm absolutely certain. Although I do believe the genes pass from the mother and possibly the thing happens in the womb. Uh, let me see if I can get in a quick one. Uh, Joseph McHale says, love the show. I was having a discussion with the, about the wife taking her husband's name in marriage with a friend recently. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the matter. In particular, does this even matter in a post-Christian world? Kind regards. Joe, well, Joe, first of all, it's not a post-Christian world. We're in a post-Christian society. It's a Christian world. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's why that's why the post-Christian world looks exactly like the pre-Christian world because they had it wrong before and they'll have it wrong after. But it is not a post-Christian world; it's a post-Christian society. So yes, it still matters. I think that a man and woman, when they are married, should become one family. I think that the woman is leaving the, her family of origin to become one flesh in the man's family. I think it is right and appropriate for her to take her husband's name, and I think it is better for the children to have a new family based on the father's family. I think these things are uh, not just customs. I think they are built into the system, the human system and can't be thrown away without throwing away something urgent. So I, I, I think you should really make that a uh, in point before you get married. We're going into member block. The rest of you are being plunged into clavenless darkness. So become a member today. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe, dailywire.com slash subscribe. Use code Claven at checkout for two months. If you're already a member, come over to member block.